Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, this is the real Twin Peaks prop fail. Uh, I would like to introduce you to my fellow panelists here. Uh, to my left is Stephen Miller, uh, founder of Twin Peaks Block, uh, internet sleuth extraordinaire. Uh, over here on the right is Jason Matson. Uh, Jason made all of the replica props on this side of the table. Uh, and our guest of honor is season two's prop master, Jeff Moore. Vinny, I'm Vinny. Love Vinny. Uh, yeah, so let's let's talk about props as loud as we can. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things I noticed is we're all straining here, so get up as close as you can just because, you know, we're going to be trying to talk over everything. So, uh, yeah, so Jeff uh, started in the first episode of the second season uh, and was prop master throughout the duration of that season. Um, you made a lot of props. You sourced a lot of props. Uh, can we talk about your your process? The process. <laughs> the process for any prop or anything on the show or film, anything, it's the script. That's it. Everything is the script. There's nothing else that exists other than the script. So it tells you everything. And that is just the, you know, the way it's always been and always will be in this media. And so everything that I had to do, that I had to get to, had to make, find, get somebody else to make for me, all came from the words on the script. It essentially is that. And there's nothing more than the script. So so what determines whether you need to make a prop from scratch or whether uh, you go out to source it from a prop menace? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, how do you uh, make a prop? Uh, let's see. I can almost look at what it says and read it and know in an instant where that's coming from, how I'm going to do it. Uh, but you have to be that fast. You have to think that way. And just through learning um, as a young prop man, I... Um, I was taught how to see that and know that, and you have a bank in your head of things. So if it says this, then I know that I can go there for that. And so it's like just this like instinct, this natural thing, because you're in that world. You are in the world of television. You're in the world of filmmaking. You need to be able to act fast and know where everything is. And so my I just sort of kind of an instinct, kind of an interesting way of putting it, but it was an instinct of knowing what I was going to be facing by just reading the words, you know. So, and then there's all the stuff in between those words that you're also looking at. Could be that, okay, we're in the diner, and if this happens and he puts this down, that's basically what you're thinking. That I'm going to put this down, I need to get this, whatever it is, that whatever this is. But then, as I'm reading that, I know I'm in a diner. I've got people eating. I've got people coming in and out of doors. I've got waiters. I've got a cook in the back. I've got all these other things that are not on this page. So that's another way that you have to sort of like, you know, just that, again, instinct. And if you don't have that when you're reading it, you're going to miss something and you're going to be behind. So then come to that. We were talking about choices, right? So that you might have that description of something that's needed, but you would go and say, well, maybe I have two or three choices of something that's something you can select. That yeah. you then present to the director, you know, or whoever's working on the show, as like, hey, these are options uh, from that. Is that. How does that work in your mind? Um, when you're, when you're showing something to a director, and one of the things I was told from the very beginning from Sarah Mokovic, who was our costume designer on the show, when I met her, I knew that she sort of had this finger on the pulse of everything that was going on that I didn't know about. And so um, working, with, working with the people around me who were I don't know, but Sarah and I crossed departments so often, and we were just kind of, um, 
almost side by side. Wardrobes and props, et cetera, team are a, almost one department in itself. So working with good department heads is really what's key to me being able to do my job. So Sarah was, I, I hope I answered your question. Well, you were talking about choices. Oh, so like and then we go to choices. You might have the idea of something and you really have the options. Yes. Choices are this, and this is what Sarah came into that conversation. When I first met her, I said, how was it to work with David? I never met the man, I didn't know anything about anything, and uh, she said, choices. Give him more than you think he wants to see. So I would go and I would grab something for um, whatever it might be, okay, whatever the prompt might be. When I went there, let me give you an example. We were in the waiting room slash Black Lodge on the last night of shooting. We were doing uh, the scene with uh, the sycamore trees are being sung. Uh, Artist Jimmy Scott. Jimmy, Scott. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy. And so David said, get me a microphone. Okay, so I need a microphone. So I went and picked out six microphones, all period pieces. Everything that didn't exist like we normally would see a sure mic or whatever it might be. And so I brought these choices to him. And it's really funny because I remember this moment quite a bit. David looked at all the choices and I had it covered, I thought. And he went, ah, it was like, you know, he didn't say anything, he just gave this sound, you know? And, uh, and I knew that, oh shit, this is, what's he gonna say? And then he went, then he started picking them up, each one of them. And then he found the one we saw on film in the midst, and uh, it was perfect. So if you don't have six or seven pieces, and Sarah reminded me right out of the gate, give him more than you think he needs to see. Choices. So that goes right to that. So. But what about sourcing rods? Like, you have prop houses and another, like, do you go uh, thrift shopping, or is it mostly just in house, like? Hollywood prop places, all of this, all of it. This, this is, this is. See this mug right here, um, the yellow mug. Uh, you've seen it all in the show. It, it, it's like this classic thing that I found. And a, and a, I, or myself or one of my assistants, I can't remember who actually brought it into the world, but it was found in a thrift shop, okay. and that's how that happens. And so sources. I have a group of people that I work with. I have Ellis Mercantile, which is the king of the universe for me in all the prop work I ever did. Ellis Mercantile was made, uh, was made in night that the building was in uh, 1908, right out in the middle of nowhere. And they were starting to shoot films out there in this area. And so Ellis was a mercantile place. I found that as my first first um, anchor place that I went to because the person I work for went to Ellis, uh, so I started with what she taught me, and I continued on to it. Thanks. Alice Mercantile is one of the biggest stars of Twin Peaks second season. It was the prop house that I get almost 99% of all the props there. Then the other source that I went to was Earl Hayes Press. Now Earl Hayes Press was where I got, let's say this one came from Earl Hayes, this cover for Earl Hayes Press. Now, when I got the first script, they said, we need a box full of Flesh World. <laughs> there was one Flesh World magazine, one. Okay, that's all they had from the previous season, and that's all I had to work with. And so, my job at that point was to go to my source, which was Earl Hayes Press, yeah. go through the stacks of adult magazine things, no faces, not too much, not too sexy, blah, 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 find it. Tell them what I needed, tell them the graphics that we needed across, gave him the look of the, of the first look, and then he, done, then he did that. Now, at Earl Hayes Press was like Ellis Mercantile, that had been around for years, uh, years and years and years. He was the oldest printing house in Hollywood. And um, I used them. Ellis Mercantile, Modern Crocs was another source I went to, and another prop house called The Hand Prop Room. Those were my sources. 
I knew right where I would go for everything, but I concentrated mostly on Alice Mercantile because it was familiar. I had connections there. It was my, it's where I found out about Twin Peaks. I was there working from another film, returning props from that film I had been working on, and a friend came to visit me on the truck, and we started talking about work, and you know, I just had to get back into it again. I just finished the show, I needed a job. And um, he said, what about Twin Peaks? And I said, yeah, you're gonna hire me, you know. I, I'm a young cream prom master. They're a hit show, they ain't gonna talk to me. Well, he pushed me and pushed me, and in the next hour, I didn't realize, but I was on the phone calling the production <laughs> office to, trying to get an interview. Yeah. And you were talking earlier uh, about the tick, on the, oh. the, the tick on the bullet. Does anybody talking, remember right? that? Yeah. Yeah. So how, how did that, how was that created? The tick on the bullet freaked me out. Okay, so I'm reading the script. Like I told you, everything's in the script. I get the script and I read this thing and we're going into the hospital. It's in the first few pages of the script and there is this uh, uh, reference to it. I was hit, I was scratching the tip, right? Underneath my, my pet, my uh, vest. vest. And uh, I was told, um, I read that they were gonna look at this. They didn't tell me they were gonna insert it, but I'm just reading the script for the first time. And I went, shit, not a tip on a bullet? What? And so, this was a first among so many firsts on this show for me. And so what I did, believe it or not, bugs, animals, anything like that is a plot. Now who, I didn't know that when I first started and then, to, you know, I was taught, hey, we gotta do the bugs for this or we gotta do the, this for that. And um, so the tick, I was going, where am I gonna get this? Where am I going to find a dead tick and put it on the end of a bullet and blah, blah. So, my other, my assistant, Rich Robinson, you'll see his name on the credits. Um, he's right under me on the, on the credits. Rich was like my right hand, you know, thank God I have Rich with me. And he goes, try us. I go, what? Try us science. And that's the name of a company that deals with bugs, alive or dead, anything in that world at all. And he goes, yeah, we'll just call Trias. And we, they'll have, what do you want? <laughs> and so I did. I had a connection there. His name was Ian. I've worked with him before, getting birds, or whatever I might have had to get. And I said, I need ticks. And he goes, alive or dead? <laughs> I was covered. I was covered. So, I, so that worry went away. And that's kind of uh, how that happened with the, took the, tick, the dead tick that you put it on I the took bullet. the dead tick. <laughs> I took a bullet, and I took that bullet, and I spent down a little bit with a hammer, so it looked like it had gone through something. I found the, the, uh, the uh, what do they call them, the, you know, the thing for those things, the tweezer thing, yes. tweezer thing, that's what they are. <laughs> if somebody pass me the tweezer thing, please. Um, <laughs> I had that um, in my kit, so I took the bullet, flattened it out, got a little bit of blood, of fake blood, put it on there, and put that damn tick. Using the blood as it's blue. Oh, <laughs> to stick it on there. It's, just, it's just corn syrup, right? And so that's how that wonderful prop wow. came to be. I would believe to hear you just had a tick in your kit already. <laughs> no, no, I did not. <laughs> a lot of spiders, but no ticks. I do want to hear about more that you kept in your kit just in case. Uh, Incidentals that you already had that came up as needed. You know, the prop truck, prop department, we are known as a supply sergeant. We are where everybody goes. Prop truck was, you name it, I had it. Anything you can think of, anything you can think of in your mind that might be touched, moved, whatever, I had on my truck. So I had to develop that kit through all my shows and all the years that I worked before I started Twin Peaks. And you just gather everything and you put it in boxes and you put it, I had boxes that said toys, that said uh, office, that said all these things, ribbons, you name it, I had it all, right? And um, so 
that was where the bread with the question again was to what was your kit? Oh, you know, like what was it? Like you know, what did you have on hand? Not only did I have that, I had these book, giant giant boxes, and they all had drawers in them. And I probably had four of them on my truck. Now each one of those drawers is labeled that tells me this is there. I got glasses in here. I got just a whole drawer full of cigarettes. I mean, it was nuts, right? And so having um, everything at hand was uh, the key to being a good prop master and a good prop team. They will ask you for anything. It's amazing. And the prop truck became the place that everybody went to for refuge, who would hide. You could hide on the prop truck. <laughs> I had a big, giant Coke cooler on there. You want to bring some, put it in the fridge? Come to the prop truck, put it there. You want a beer? Prop truck. Booze? <laughs> prop truck. Lee had it. Cigarettes? Middle of it, three o'clock in the morning, you're out in the middle of uh, the woods shooting something, and the guy runs out of cigarettes up in the, in the B, B light up on top. If he needs smokes, props. <laughs> so we did, we were, I think, supply sergeant really kind of just puts it all into perspective of anything you want, we just might have. And it was needed because you didn't have a lot of time. And that's probably a big piece of it, was that you get the script and you have days hours when something is being shot. Well, when you get the script, you go after it when everything is on the script. What my kit was, was having everything they didn't ask for. Everything that they put on the page. So all of a sudden, I, I got these guys coming out of this office room and I need briefcases. Well, I better have a whole bunch of briefcases sitting on a shelf somewhere on my truck for that exact moment or something like that. So it was kind of, um, you know, on the fly all the time. And when, when you went to like Ellis Mercantile, you're printing props, right? You're just, you're borrowing them, you're paying a fee, whatever it is, you're getting this, and you're borrowing for a period of time, you return them out to the show house. There's two ways of renting. One is called production rental, and that's where you go off and get all the props that you're gonna carry with you on your truck for the whole run of the show. And then you have the instant props, i.e. I need these for the next two episodes. They're going to show up here, here, and here. So, the um, the quiver I like to call it, which is what the big it was a big giant quiver. The prop truck was where you put all your arrows, your slings and arrows are all inside that thing. And so it was just a matter of being knowing what happens as a human in the world, and that's what a prop person does. We create everything that goes on in the streets, everything that happens in a room like this. Now the actors may be here talking to you, but everything else is going on. And it, when it's good, it's seamless. And you don't even realize that those people are actually acting. That's good background. Um, and I, in my department, and wardrobe, were the key to background artists. We gave them life, i.e. wardrobe, what they look like, and the other is something to do. So that's what it was like, yeah. Love that part. I love background. And Twin Peaks was the Twin Peaks was the background show, the best background show I've ever worked on in my life. Uh, except for possibly pushing daisies. That was kind of close. I love that. I loved working on that show. But Twin Peaks had all these actions. I mean, I was watching Diane's show, the Smoking Maytag Band. Um, there was so much going on in her episode. And a lot of it had to do with background. So it added life to it. It added, it added into the richness of depth to the to Yes. The yeah, it's making it look real. Do you recall anything that was, like, what was the most challenging thing for you to sort of sort of make? Well, the puzzle box was the most challenging because it had so many moving parts. Uh, I think I talked about that last year about the puzzle box, but it was probably the most challenging prop I ever had to deal with. I mean, I was explaining to these guys a little while ago about when you're looking at the moon at the top of the box and, you're, and, you, and you see all these different uh, the signs, the astrological signs, all of that, there was actually three buttons on that box that worked. So, although I was watching it the other day and I was noticing when the actors were pushing on it, it was um, Piper and uh, they were fighting over the box and they started pressing, uh, what was his name? Thank you. 
I always forget it, what his name is called. Andrew, Andrew Packer. Andrew Packer. Andrew. Andrew um, started punching the, the different symbols. And I said, I told Andrew before that, I said, listen, this doesn't do anything. This one over here doesn't, do, but don't touch this one until you want to open the And when you push this, a little button inside that box released a something that was so primitive of a setup, and the drawer pops out. There's a spring, a latch, a button. It's that simple. But that was one of the most, at the end, once we get into that, there's another box. And they're supposed to smash that box. And then inside that box was a metal box. And so that was probably my most challenging in such a short amount of time. I think I had a week to wow. get that together. And it, so I didn't it, touch it. The yeah. only thing I did was take it to Ellisburg and Tile again and send it to the manufacturing department and told them what I needed showed them uh, an idea of what I wanted, that top, they did all the artwork on it, they did everything on it, it was perfect. I got lucky, so. A movie prop with an action and all that stuff that was going on, fighting and had John being a joint, it was rigged to break apart. I, that's another thing I had to do before, so I had to make it so that when they broke it, it wasn't hard for them to break. When they hit it, it couldn't go, it had to just shatter. So that was also part of the equation of keeping it safe. I never took my eyes off that prop when it was on camera. In fact, I was underneath it with a blanket trying to catch it every time they dropped it. So, uh, <laughs> so that was that was that was wonderful prop and the most challenging, I have to say. But I will say this. Now here's a prop you wouldn't think of as challenging. Okay. The postcard from James. Success from San Francisco. I needed a San Francisco postcard. Could not find one in all of Hollywood. I could not find a Florida. <laughs> we, we identified that one. We found that one. And I again went to Ellis. Ellis, they had it. And I pulled this giant. They had all these. Oh, this place was so old and beautiful. And I opened this drawer. And there was all these postcards. I mean, this drawer was big and deep, and you know. And I said, I gotta find it here. It's got it. Something's gotta be. And it had to be blank because I had to write everything that was in there. So I dug through that. And thought, this was my last resort at, at this point. I had been everywhere I thought I could find a postcard there. And I went through an old, old drawer in Elvis and found the San Francisco postcard. On, on the topic of handwriting. Uh, <laughs> props, props with handwriting, I'm always curious who wrote it. Does the actor typically write it? Uh, uh, we've got one, this is an original prop from the second season. This is my handwriting. That was, that was yes. my question. This is yeah. one of uh, Wyndham Earl's evidence tags. Yes. He sends these items of clothing uh, to the different police stations, uh, and the tags are all handwritten. So all handwritten by me. And yes. <laughs> and you kept these tags in your kit. Yeah, I just they kept them there for too many years. <laughs> I um, actually, when the handwriting thing is very interesting because to me, um, I have the worst handwriting in the world. I mean, it's horrible, right? But I had an assistant, Rich, again, my assistant, Rich, and we all three touched on to this because my other assistant, Stefan, uh, did a couple of things. For example, Stefan did the, the mat with the, uh, when you see where uh, Wyndham had been or whatever, oh, yeah. that whole yeah, thing. Did, yeah. He did all that drawing, for example. But Rich was the guy who did most of the handwriting in every one of the props that you see because he was a, a commercial artist, genius guy, right? So lucky to have him on my team. Um, Rich did uh, the Wyndham Earl three note uh, thing that he sent to. Now, in the beginning of that scene, this is one of those faux pas that I really hate to see, but I understand how come it happened. Um, it, we're in Wyndham's cabin. He's got Leo's hand on a pencil, and he's making Leo write the note. Does everybody remember that? Yeah. Okay, so he's forcing Leo to write the note about uh, the poem that he's sending uh, out to the, to the girls, Sunshine, whatever it all that was, if you remember. And um, so in the scene that you see, they're, they're writing, and he's got the picture of the queens on top of that piece of paper he's writing it on. And then he tears it, if you remember, and then he stuffs it into an envelope, 
and he licks it and uh, has Leo lick it. And um, that was the letter that was supposed to arrive to the women, right? To our girls. And so <laughs> it was one of those things where, you know, of course I couldn't let that go out the way we shot it because we really didn't see much more than him reaching in and sort of getting his hand going. So against all my best judgment, I, when I did the paper, I had Rich write it out, um, the poem, the whole thing, and then I, um, and we ripped it the way we wanted it done, and we stuffed the envelopes. But it was one of those things that pissed me off in the sense that I really couldn't, I didn't want to not see the picture of the queens on top of that piece of paper. It was, and then diary, whether you go to the diary and see the handwriting inside of there. I have been racking my brain and now I, in my research I'm trying to get either Sabrina Sutherland, uh, Paula Samatsu to help me remember if I asked one of them to do the handwriting because no matter how we tried, none of us could write like a woman in <laughs> what we would have thought more. So I had somebody do that. I think you I know, know who it is. I mean, I know. Oh, I good. Know. Yeah, remind <laughs> me after this. <laughs> okay, good. <'Cause laughs> I want to I'll, know. I'll, I'll source it first. Tell them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know? I Well, I remember hearing about it, so I'll find out. Oh, I'd yeah. love to hear that story because <laughs> that's going to help me in my book. Oh, good. Okay. You all know that I'm writing a book. I don't know if you do or not. No, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm writing a book about <laughs> season two. And it's the props, and it's called Who Propped Laura Palmer. Now, Scott Ryan, who we all know, um, the publisher who did a lot of books for us, is going to be our publisher. And uh, we're looking for a 25 release. Maybe next year at this time we'll be actually having awesome. some books in front of us as we do this, as that fingers crossed that it all happens. I'm looking for the artwork now for the cover and, uh, and writing every day about it.